Hi everybody, welcome to The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith, joined today by Jonathan Alter, author, director, columnist. You've done a little bit of everything in your career. How are you? Thanks for having me, DJ. I'm doing great. Of course, it's my pleasure. So the reason you're here today is your great new documentary, Breslin and Hamill. And, you know, let's just, let's just talk all about it because here are two giants and titans in journalism history in New York. So how do you get inspired to first take this guy? Well, you know, um, I had known uh, both Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill, not well, but for quite a long time. Uh, I first met uh, Jimmy when I was writing a tough piece about yeah. him in 1986 when I was at Newsweek and was the media critic. And, uh, you know, I checked in with him in, in the years since, and we talked to each other once in a while. We became friendly after my piece appeared. I think he, you know, liked the fact that I was tough, although, as I say in, uh, in the film, um, uh, when he didn't know how the piece was going to come out, he, he said, um, you F with me, I'll F you good, because I'm the effing John Gotti of journalism, and never effing forget it, right? On the that phone. was quite a lot, I'm and sure you're like, yeah, I'm like okay. I was, you know, I was in my, uh, I wasn't 30 yet, you know, right. I'm like, whoa, okay. So, but I think he, he felt like if you could deal with him, mm -hmm. then he would respect you and if he liked the work that you were doing otherwise. So we were friendly. And then um, in 2015, I hadn't talked to him in uh, a few years and I ran into his stepdaughter okay. who lived in, lives in Montclair, New Jersey, where all three of the filmmakers, John Block, Steve McCarthy and I, were the co-directors of this film and we all lived there. And I ran into Jimmy's stepdaughter, and I said, how's he doing? And she basically said, well, he's, I think he's mm -hmm. not long for this world. And I said, has anybody gone over with a camera and just sat down and like, got his stories? And she said, well, people have tried, but they haven't really done it. So Steve McCarthy, who I had done a lot of uh, NBC News pieces with uh, for the Today Show and Nightly News, and John Block was a Dateline NBC producer, former producer. The three of us just took a camera with Steve's kids who were in their er early 20s as crew. Mm. We didn't have a deal with HBO or anybody. We didn't know whether it was a film. We mm. just went to Jimmy's apartment. We picked up Pete Hamill, brought him up there, and we just sat him down in the summer of 2015 and started talking to them and, and got a lot on tape and then we started looking for archival material we started interviewing other people incredibly prominent people yeah you had great people all throughout you know and everybody we asked except for david berkowitz the son of sam mm. you know serial killer and sirhan sirhan who killed bobby kennedy except for them like everybody said yes so right. you know we have robert de niro and gloria steinem and spike lee's in there spike yep. lee and tom brokaw mm -hmm. and tom wolf you know doing one of his last interviews yeah and, right and uh you know colin quinn and lots of great journalists and uh, you know and shirley mclean who dated uh pete hamill at the same time he was dating jackie onassis right. is, she's in the film and so everybody said yes and um, suddenly, you know, we started amassing all this material and we had hundreds of hours of archival and of interviews to go through and figure out how do we make this into a coherent and compelling uh, story. And so uh, it took three years wow. for us to do this film. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot packed into that hour 45 of the doc. And, you know, we were talking off camera. New York was just such a different place back in the 60s and the 70s yeah. when these guys were in their prime. And it was just a, a grittier New York. So just, just take our, our, our audience back and just describe what New York was like at that time when these guys with very little education were rising up through the newspaper ranks. Well, they had very little formal education. In those days, you didn't need to, you know, when they came up in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, so ne neither of them, uh, Pete didn't even finish high school. Right. He moved out into his own apartment when he was 16. About like $7 an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Jimmy went to work in the newsroom when he was uh, 16. But right. they were self-taught, mm -hmm. you know, very, very well-educated uh, themselves um, by their own efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but as Nick Pileggi, you know, who wrote uh, Goodfellas and other great movies, as he says in, uh, in Deadline Artists in our film, um, uh, you could go to Oxford for 4,000 years and you couldn't learn how to cover the streets the way 
Jimmy Breslin yeah, did. No and yeah. it, was, it was a grittier time, and there was a lot of crime. I, I think there's about uh, 300 or so people a year who are killed in New York now. At that time, there were close to 2,000 wow. murders wow. a year. And, um, and it was just a, a, a different place. And, um, and a more colorful place and all, you know, you had these gangsters and we had John Gotti uh, right. on prison video talking about Jimmy Breslin. Incredible, yeah. And also, print journalists were a big deal. Mm. Um, they, these were these swashbuckling, larger than life. Can you imagine a print journalist today dating the most famous woman in the world? No, that, 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 was, that was so fascinating Or a to print me. journalist yeah. today hosting Saturday Night Live. Jimmy <laughs> right. Breslin was yeah. host of Saturday Night Live. Guest host of Saturday Night Live. You could Live. never imagine it today. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the film is in some ways, a, 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 it takes you back to a lost New York, um, for better and for, for worse, but a New York um, that was um, riven by race and class. and. The thing about Breslin and Hamill uh, is that they were always standing up for the little guy. And we have um, you know, Spike Lee and these two uh, revered African-American columnists, um, uh, Les Payne, the late Les Payne and Earl Caldwell, and they talk about Jimmy and Pete's enormous sympathy mm. for the African-American community and standing up when, you know, when uh, a woman jogger was raped in Central Park and these five black teenagers were arrested. Central Park Five. Central Park yeah. Five, you know you know about it. And you probably know that, you know, Donald Trump, this is 30 years ago. Full page ad. Full page yeah. ad saying, um, you know, they need the death penalty. Mm. He didn't even wait for them to be indicted. Right. And they went to prison and it turned out later that DNA evidence showed that they did not commit this crime. And they, you know, Spike Lee says they, they lost you know, six years of their lives in prison. And, and um, Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin, in real time, were standing up to Donald Trump in, in the same way they stood up to all the people who were siding with uh, a guy known as the subway gunman, the death wish gunman, mm -hmm. who, you know, was imitating a Charles Bronson movie and shot these black teenagers on the subway. And in real time, when the rest of the city was terrified of crime, these guys are saying, wait a minute, you know, th this is a rushed judgment. What Trump did is just wrong. Yeah. And, but they ripped him in beautiful language. Yes. And, um, you know, and that, that was a preview of, of everything that's going on now. And, and I think makes you think when you're watching the film, wow, if these guys were in their prime now, what well, that, they do that, that was one of the questions I had yeah. for you. When you think yeah. about Breslin and Hamill, when they're throwing their fastball, there was nobody better. Yeah. You're thinking about them today in 2019. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure your mind wanders and think, how would they take what on Trump? Did. How and would they I, take on everything? And I actually asked them, and uh, interestingly, um, you know, we asked a number of people about Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with the advice of um, a really talented HBO executive, Nancy Abraham, who gave us great notes, um, she said, you know, you've got Trump with the Central Park Five. Right. Keep modern day Trump out of it. Like, let the viewer think that. It's sort of like in a, in a film, whether it's uh, a scripted entertainment or a documentary, mm -hmm. you want to show, not tell. Yeah. Like, let the viewer think that, and, which they all do. Everybody Absolutely. sees the yeah. movie thinks, rather than hitting them over the head right. with it. Yeah, right? you didn't need to at didn't all. Didn't need to do yeah. it. I thought that was a great note. So, so, um, you know, that, that is part of the subtext of this film. Hmm, no doubt about it. So uh, let's focus on Breslin for a little bit because his yeah. reporting was top notch. So, yeah. you know, you take us back to Kennedy's surgeon and the guy that's digging the grave for him and even his experience in Crown Heights, it, it, nothing ever changed him in terms of he was going to give voice to the voiceless. But what do you think were the biggest factors in making Jimmy Breslin the reporter and writer who he was? So, um, I think it was something that um, Dan Barry, who's a columnist for the New York Times, and uh, with uh, Jim Dwyer and Sam Roberts, Gail Collins, they're all in the film talking about this. And, you know, Dan conjures this image of a, a, a lonely kid. As Breslin says in the film, he came from a, you know, a nice, cold <laughs> Irish family. Right. And um, his father leaves when he's very young. 
his mother tries to commit suicide, and he takes um, refuge in, in the world of newspapers. And um, we have some old video of his aunt that was shot years ago where she says, you know, from the time he was a little boy, he wanted to be a newspaper man. Mm. So um, he, he was kind of preparing for, for that life, and he was reporting when he was really young. He had a newspaper that he drew by hand called The Flash in his neighborhood in Queens. And this was very resonant for me because I did the same thing when mm, I was about wow. 10 years old, you know, and I ended up going into journalism. Yeah. And so, but with Jimmy, like when I did it, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, my headline would be, John Alter loses six baseballs in the bushes in one summer, right? That, that Jimmy's was mother, or the original headline was, mother tried suicide. And then he changed it. Past tense uh, to active voice. Yeah, yeah. mother tries, somebody mm. told him, which is one of my favorite parts yeah. of this film. It's so simple, yeah, but yeah, so yeah. beautiful in so yeah, many different mother ways. Mother tries suicide. But I said, like, why did you write, I asked him, I said, Jimmy, why did you write that? Your mother just tried to kill herself. And he said, I had to write an article. You know, he was always he was, focused on getting that article. He was 10 years old, yeah. like he, he had to do this. Yeah. You know, it's just something in him had to do this. And um, uh, his, his writing talent, I think, was partly inculcated by, his, by teachers in his Catholic school, people in his family. But uh, he and Pete had very different writing styles, but both were wonderful. And we try to show in the film how they wrote. Because even if you don't want to be a journalist, aren't that interested in journalism, everybody's got something they write. Absolutely, you know? and that's beautiful writing, especially you hear them voicing yeah. it throughout the doc. Yeah, well, that was cool. Jimmy doesn't voice it. That's the actor, Michael Rispoli. Gotcha. Because um, Jimmy um, you know, was too weak, and then he died. Right. And this guy who was in The Deuce and the, was in The Sopranos is Tony Soprano's father in the flashback episode. Good person. Fantastic yeah. actor, Michael Rispoli. And you think it's Jimmy Breslin right. uh, reading um, his work, but his was sort of rat-tat-tat. Mm. And, and Pete was more of the poet. Right, it was prose, the, you know, that just happened to be in a newspaper. New York, yeah. yeah. And, and Robert Krolwich in the film says, you know, reading Pete Hamill was like reading a French novel, mm. you know. And, but but it's still, it was just wonderful writing. So we wanted to convey all of that, and, and, and in terms of Jimmy's reporting, I think what he understood from an early age was that the better story was in the loser's locker room, right. to go where the other reporters weren't. Like if, you, if you're covering some sports event, you know, all the reporters afterwards, and I've covered sports, they all pile in, you know, Friday right, you want to talk to the champion, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and um, I remember uh, one time um, I took my son to the NCAA finals when he was a, you know, rabid young basketball fan. And the University of Illinois was like in the finals right. and they lost, I think, to uh, North, UNC. North Carolina, yeah. Yeah, and so we, we took Jimmy Breslin's advice and we went into the loser's locker room. And we were able to talk to all the players and we got a much more poignant story out of it. And Tommy, as a 10-year-old, is able to ask questions. Yeah. Meanwhile, he would have been like at the back of a huge pack. Right, never getting a question. Wouldn't have seen yeah. it, the players, you know. So Jimmy believed that. And then later, in, in what was his most famous column, uh, after Kennedy was assassinated, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he, everybody else is covering the funeral and you know all the dignitaries coming in and Jimmy says, I can't get a story here. I can't make a living doing this. There's a thousand reporters here. So he goes and he talks to the, the, the poor sucker who had to dig, uh, dig the grave, the grave yeah. for $3 an hour on his day off. And he gets this fantastic column out of it, which you know, Tom Wolfe in the film describes as you know, one of the great columns of all time. It's taught in journalism yeah. schools, and it, it's a really important thing to go away from the pack. That's where you get the good story, and you also have to go to the story. I mean, I find there's so many great young reporters now, I'm really impressed with many of them, but some of them don't realize you, you can't do it by text and email. And or phone, no, you have to go. You have to yeah. go. You, you need this face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, so they, um, they really, you know, got there, and then they knew how to, both of them knew how to write it in an almost novelistic way, but mm. with facts, 
you know, not made up, but using in sort of nonfiction narrative at its best, storytelling at, at its best. Well, you mentioned that point, and when I think of Hamill, I think of his 9-11 piece and how Unbelievable it's piece. his personal experience, yeah. but it's this incredible narrative, and then you throw in the prose as well. I mean, that hits yeah. you right in the gut, yes. and that's a personal experience, yes. and I, th I think for me, that was his best one. He how do you feel? He wrote this on 9-11. Mm. You know, it ran in the Daily News on, on the 12th of September, 2001. It's just a beautiful piece of writing, yeah. and um, it's kind of a haunting you know, sequence. Yeah, really harrowing. And, yeah. And I, I think it was one of the very best, maybe the very best things that were written about that day. Yeah, no uh, question about it. Um, so we're, we're trying to like uh, do a movie that's not just about these two guys, but it's, it's about race and class in New York. It's about major events in the second half of the 20th century. They were like Zelig or Forrest Gump. They were at all these right. in Vietnam, Watergate. Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, both of them were inches from Robert F. Kennedy when he shot in, in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And then they wrestle the assassin to the ground, mm. the two of them and a couple other guys. And so they were just there for everything. And they shared a newsroom together, too. They shared a newsroom together so that all these great Right, the Lupica the stories mafia, were great, you know, yeah. with him being right there at the center of everything. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, you know their their secretary that they shared was from a, a, a mafia family. She mm. was a mafia princess, <laughs> and, and there's just a lot of great stories that kind of come up from this. And then the crazy period when um, when Pete was the editor of the New York Post. Yeah, and, that whole um, thing. Uh, we, we really see the the zaniness of of New York tabloid journalism where they, the, basically the inmates take over the asylum after right. the owner fires Pete and they put out the paper mm -hmm. from a, 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 a caf cafeteria in the building because right. Pete's not allowed in the newsroom, he's been fired and you know they have headlines like, who is this nut talking about the <laughs> owner <laughs> yeah. in the paper? Yeah. You know, it was a, re a short lived rebellion mm. but a lot of fun to, to watch and then we also have you know, where um, Jimmy really messed up mm -hmm. and uh, we don't let him off the hook for his um, his uh, real shortcomings. Right. I mean, and you, you had to address it. You know, it's yeah. part of the story and it's part of the yeah. man, you know? Yeah. And people will obviously see that too. So yeah. when people look at this film, obviously they're going to think about the journalism industry as a whole. You know, you've been in the game for a long time. Yeah. You guys say in the doc, over 400 people were working for the Daily News at one point. There was less than 50. So right. how do you see the industry today and how do you see it going forward? So um, the answer is we don't know how it's going to go. We're in a period of transition. We don't know what the new business models are. The good news is there's a lot of talented young people who are coming up. Um, we just have to figure out how to subsidize them. And I, I think that it's going to be, a lot of the time, it's going to be a nonprofit model. So mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos, not Amazon, but Bezos himself, set up a nonprofit to buy the Washington Post, right. which is doing great reporting yeah, on Trump. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Mark Benioff of Salesforce just bought Time Magazine, where my daughter works as a reporter. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a nonprofit mm -hmm. that now owns it. So maybe there's a future for that, but there continues to be a real crisis at the local level. Yeah. And, and um, uh, Richard Cohen, who writes a column in the Washington Post, says in the film, you know, it's at the local level that your pocket gets picked. State House, City Hall, you know. If you're gonna care about something in journalism, that's what it should be. National reporting now is okay. Right. Um, so it, it's alarming to me. I guess I would say, you know, buy a local <laughs> newspaper, support your right, local. Support local journalism. Local journalism, local yeah. journalism and um, eventually it's gonna sort itself out. So I'm not that pessimistic, mostly because I think there, there are people who are a lot smarter than my generation who are, are coming up and have new ways of storytelling. And as Gloria Steinem says in the film, you know, they've been telling stories since the caveman. Right. That's, you know, if, if a caveman is saying what's going on in a cave down, down uh, the forest, you know, that's local news. Right? It'll always be part of our it's society. It's always going to be yeah. part of it, and it's just a question of sort of old wine and new bottles and figuring out how to make the technology uh, work for us. But I, I, I don't think that video can do everything that print can, mm. and, and so I hope that 
the written word doesn't get written out of these narrative traditions that we're now starting to to develop. Because when you see their writing in this film, um, you're just filled with kind of awe mm -hmm. about what a well-written sentence can do yeah. and convey. Absolutely. And yeah. I've talked about it with other people, just the longevity of the written word versus video. Because it's great yeah. seeing Breslin hosting Saturday Night Live, but reading his words, reading yeah. what he was writing about Son of Sam, like that's just on a different level. And yeah. you, just, you just can't compare. A lot of it's really funny. I mean, yeah. the, the thing um, that uh, has struck me is, you know, when you make one of these things, you don't know, are, are people going to laugh? And they la the audiences at film festivals and premiere, they, they laughed um, sometimes in places that you I wouldn't didn't expect. expect yeah. But they were laughing. Mm. So the film is poignant and, and in some cases tragic because Jimmy Breslin's personal life became very tragic. But um, there's also a lot of laughs in it. No question about it. Well, Jonathan, it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. People can check out the doc on Monday. Thank you so much for yeah, coming in. Thanks. Yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.